I'm Amber Elise from Washington University in St. Louis, and I am delighted to present the Flexor Origin Slide Surgical Technique. These are our disclosures. I am a speaker for Oxygen, Checkpoint, and BioCircuit. We present the case of an 11-year-old girl with a history of left radius and ulna fracture reduced at an outside emergency department and treated with reduction in casting at an outside hospital. The patient and her mother had reported excruciating pain following the reduction. She then presented to us four months after injury with neurologic deficits and restricted motion consistent with a Volkman's contracture, likely secondary to missed compartment syndrome at the time of reduction. This patient had an exam consistent with SUVI moderate Volkman's contracture with limited supination and restricted ability to fully extend her fingers. The patient also had median and ulnar nerve dysfunction with dense paresthesia and atrophy of the thenar and hypothenar muscles. The Volkman's angle is determined by finding at which angle of wrist flexion the fingers can be fully extended. You can see specifically there is an inability to extend the middle and ring fingers with the wrist held in neutral, putting her right at the junction between SUGI mild and SUGI moderate Volkman's contracture. The SUGI classification is a system used to describe the severity of Volkman's ischemic contracture. It is divided into three categories based on the extent of muscle and nerve damage, with the mildest forms affecting the deepest muscles. Key features of the mild stage include partial ischemia of the FDP, no significant nerve involvement, and no contracture of the intrinsic muscles or joints. The moderate stage involves more extensive muscle fibrosis, including the FDP, FPL, and FDS muscles. Neurologic impairment is always present. In the severe stage, the damage is extensive, involving both the flexor and extensor compartments with severe neurologic deficits, including complete palsy of all the intrinsic hand muscles. Indications for the flexor slide include SUVI moderate and severe contractures and contractures associated with cerebral palsy. While fractional lengthening and Z lengthening can lengthen one muscle at a time, the flexor origin slide targets the entire involved muscle group. For children with wrist, finger, and thumb flexor contractures, whether they have some voluntary function of the flexor muscles or not, this is the most powerful strategy for releasing contracture. Advantages of the procedure include that it does not cause any internal damage to the muscle and allows the muscle to find its own resting length, which preserves muscle strength. Ultimately, this patient was determined to be a surgical candidate, and we proceeded with a flexor origin slide surgical procedure. This case is performed supine with a sterile upper extremity tourniquet. Bipolar electrocautery is used for hemostasis, nerve graft donor site, and instrumentation for nerve repair or neurolysis are required as well. In the following video, we will demonstrate the surgical technique for the flexor origin slide. For the incision, relevant landmarks are the medial epicondyle of the humerus and the wrist flexion crease. The incision is made approximately four to five centimeters proximal to the medial epicondyle on the medial distal arm, traveling posterior to the medial epicondyle and continuing on an anterior medial longitudinal course down the volar aspect of the ulna and extending down to the wrist. The length of the incision may vary depending on the severity of the contracture. The incision is carried down to the muscle fascia and care is taken to identify and protect the cutaneous nerves. We begin by identification of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. This is effectively a cubital tunnel release. The ulnar nerve is identified proximal to the medial epicondyle and is released from underneath the arcative struthers. It is traced distally and Osborne's ligament is released, exposing the nerve as it passes between the two heads of the flexicarpial nerus. The interval between the flexor and extensor compartments is now opened distally to begin to elevate the flexor muscles from the ulna. Muscle is raised from the bone with bipolar cautery to avoid damage to the periosteum. We work both proximally and distally from known to unknown to ensure that critical structures are protected. At the beginning of the case, the section is carried out proximally towards the flexor origin and the flexor carpial nerus is carefully elevated from the ulna using bipolar cautery. Remembering that the ulnar nerve passes between the two heads of the FCU, care must be taken not to injure the nerve branches. We will identify these branches just distal to the cubital tunnel and ensure that they are protected before we fully release the flexor carpi ulnaris origin. You can see the nerve branches here. As we continue, we must also take care not to violate the medial collateral ligament as it is closely related to the flexor pronator origin. 
Next, the origins of the flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor digitorum superficialis are mobilized from the ulna, and the interosseous membrane in the anterior interosseous nerve and artery can be visualized. An essential component of this operation is transposition of the ulnar nerve anteriorly along with the muscle slide. As the release continues to avoid traction on the nerve, we will have to perform the transposition. A subcutaneous pocket is created anterior to the medial epicondyle, which may require triceps fascia and partial medial head release. During this portion of the case, care must be taken to avoid excessive traction and manipulation of the ulnar nerve and to protect the vascular supply in the vasonervosum. The nerve should lie in a relaxed position with the elbow extended. The ulnar head of the pronator teres is also released, exposing the brachialis muscle. Again, take care to avoid injury to the medial collateral ligament and the elbow joint capsule. As we move from ulnar to radial across the interosseous membrane, there is critical vascular anatomy to be aware of. The common interosseous artery is identified at its bifurcation approximately six centimeters from the elbow flexion crease and is traced back to the ulnar artery and then the brachial artery, which is identified medial to the biceps tendon and in close proximity to the median nerve. We further expose the common interosseous artery branching to give rise to the posterior interosseous artery and the anterior interosseous artery. Careful dissection ensures the preservation of these vessels to avoid compromising distal blood flow. The posterior interosseous artery, as the dominant blood supply to the extensor compartment, must be preserved to avoid compromising the extensor musculature. Additionally, communicating branches between the ulnar artery and the posterior interosseous artery must be identified and protected as the dissection proceeds. These connections play a supportive role in maintaining the collateral circulation to the forearm. Distally, the anterior interosseous artery is found with the accompanying anterior interosseous nerve. With the critical vascular anatomy now exposed and protected, we can proceed with releasing the flexor muscles from the radius. The adequacy of the release and the mobility of the flexor mass are periodically assessed by ranging the patient's fingers and checking for points of restriction, which are then released. After the flexor release is complete, attention is brought back to the ulnar nerve to ensure that the transposition has not resulted in any kinking. Further release of the triceps fascia here allows for a more relaxed position of the nerve when the wrists and fingers are fully extended. The release is complete when full passive motion is achievable. As an adjunct to the flexor origin slide, neurolysis of the median and ulnar nerves is often performed to release adhesions, decompress the nerves, and allow for reconstruction when needed. The median nerve is the most susceptible to injury, lying between the superficial and deep flexor compartments. The median nerve is seen in this case compressed by scar, but otherwise intact. The zone of injury of the median nerve correlates to the site of fracture callus and muscle fibrosis. The ulnar nerve is also explored to assess for any nerve damage. In more severe cases of Wolfman's contracture, there's a high likelihood of identification of infarcted nerve. In this case, an area of injury and necrosis of the ulnar nerve was identified with the nerve no longer in continuity. Because this patient had presented early, we were still within the window of opportunity for recovery of motor nerve function if this nerve were to be re reconstructed. Again, we can see how this zone of injury relates to the fracture callus and fibrotic FCP muscle. Following release of the tourniquet, the wound is irrigated, hemostasis is achieved using electrocautery, and a drain is placed. Following a period of reperfusion, nerve stimulation is used to confirm the integrity of the nerves. Here, the median nerve stimulation produces weak activation of the lumbrical muscles and no thenar activity and a robust response of the finger flexors. While stimulation of the ulnar nerve produces primarily responses in the forearm musculature alone, which is consistent with the ulnar nerve injury identified. Next, the nerve is prepared for reconstruction by freshening the ends of the nerve. The proximal nerve should demonstrate healthy interfascicular bleeding, and the distal nerve should demonstrate normal architecture. The resulting gap is reconstructed with cabled sural nerve autographed, which has been pre-cabled with fibrin glue. The construct is secured with 90 nylon sutures using a microscope. The fascicles are aligned and the repair is not bunched. Uh, the excess fibrin glue around the cable fascicles here makes the appearance seem misaligned, but the fascicles themselves are well aligned. A nerve wrap is applied around the coaptations to prevent fascicular escape and adhesion. The primary goals of nerve repair in these cases are to restore motor and sensory function. Even in delayed presentations, nerve reconstruction may improve sensory recovery. Following closure, the patient is placed in a long arm splint with the elbow flexed and with the wrist and fingers in maximal extension. 
This above elbow immobilization is kept in place for three weeks, followed by conversion to a short arm cast for an additional three weeks. Postoperative occupational therapy is a critical component of recovery after a flexor origin slide, and patients are started on a progressive strengthening protocol following immobilization. For children who have not reached skeletal maturity, nighttime splinting is used to help protect against recurrent contracture. The flexor origin slide, like any surgical procedure, has the risk of complications. Adhesions may form, restricting movement and reducing the efficacy of the surgery. Weakness may develop from prolonged immobilization or excessive release of the flexor mass, which may result in reduced grip strength. Operating around the median and ulnar nerves carries risks. Neuropraxia and even permanent nerve injury is possible, and neuroma formation can occur at repair sites. Vascular complications, while less common, can occur, and these include hematomas and ischemia. Joint-related complications are also possible, including instability due to damage to the medial collateral ligament, capsular injury, or stiffness from immobilization. Additionally, patients and families are counseled for general surgical risks such as infection, poor scarring, and delayed wound healing. Improved passive motion is seen immediately following removal of splinting, but patients are all sent to OT for strengthening. This patient is seen here at four months postoperative with full active motion. And here at eight months postoperative, demonstrating improved supination, improved VNR function, and some recovery of her intrinsic function. As well as an advancing tunnel now found at the ring finger, metacarpal neck and head. Thank you so much.